I think we've got it now. Yes, thank you very much for joining us promptly as usual, 11 o'clock. Let me start with a rather <clears throat> sad news. Mark called me earlier on today saying that he's got some serious bereavement, bereavement at home family. So he had to rush back to UK. Uh, so Mark is not joining us. He, I believe Mark will be joining us next week when it comes to AGM on 18th and 17th. So let me start with an update. As far as intermanagers concerned, we are gearing up for the meeting on the 17th and 18th. We've got 42 people booked at the moment to attend, which is pretty good. I think they will be the best one since COVID. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you. And obviously we will be making arrangements for the debate. Debate will be Zoomable, so it will be on Zoom. And AGM will be on Teams. And uh, then executive committee will not be Oh, actually, we need to think because there might be somebody dialing in, but we've got a pretty good uh, turnout on the executive committee. On the 9th, two days ago, on the 9th of January, uh, BIMCO held a very good drug trafficking in shipping conference in Houston. We were involved in that. We were partners together with other NGOs, and I was reported, I received a message that it was very well attended and there is homework for us. As you know, our members are very, very keen on sorting criminalization of seafarers. That is the subject where intermanager is championing the issue. The other thing, uh, today we've got a Tineke with us. Tineke will be taking over from me in two, three minutes, and we will be talking about the uh, navigating waves of diversity, or basically bridging generational gaps when it comes to communication and everything, and I'm looking forward to it. We've been working with Tineke on this subject for a long, long time. Now, on the 8th of March, and you will be receiving message very shortly, um, there is a European Commission initiative honoring the, the, the diversity. And they are looking, see you Peter, they are looking to get ship management companies nominations for those companies which really honor diversity. There will be more on this. Debbie is working on the uh, issue. We will be making announcements through our regular channels, but we will also be trying to get the social media going. Um, 17, 18 is AGM, as I said, and uh, pretty busy in London. It looks like I have to be in London again because we've got few meetings. Uh, I am new secretary general and uh, drinks reception on the 31st of January. We will be welcoming Arsenio and uh, on the 1st of February, there is a very important OKIMF meeting uh, on enclosed spaces. Now, the very important and interesting thing is in this particular sphere, enclosed spaces, lifeboat accidents, falls and trips, Intermanager is the organization which mobilized a lot of resources around the world. Not necessarily ours, I mean Intermanager, but all other NGOs working with us, and we became a name. And I would like to remind, remind you that we've got our statistics available on our website for everybody to see those safety statistics are there. That's all from me as an update. And look how good I am. Three minutes, job done. Tineke, over to you. And I believe you will be sharing screen, right? Yes, thank you, uh, Captain. Uh, thank you for inviting me. You all hear me OK? Loud and clear. Yeah, perfect. That's the first thing. <laughs> you never know, right? So let me share my screen. There we go. Yep. Tineke, we can uh, see your screen. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I can't see you now, but that's uh, all right. So if something's wrong, just shout through it, yeah, I promise. So we're going to talk today. And yeah, been... I'll do the traffic, no worries. Okay, good, good, good. So checking in, that I've not been talking to myself for 50 minutes, you know. <laughs> so talking about navigating the waves of diversity and uh, Dr. Uh, Captain Kuba and I have been uh, discussing this in, in quite a lot of detail for how we bridge the generational gaps in a maritime workplace. So thank you for inviting me on that. And first of all, for those who don't know me, um, a quick introduction. I'm Tina Kasut. I own my own business in 2019. I'm a maritime well-being advocate and I work with organizations and small teams and individuals to 
celebrate confident collaborative teams to harness the whole team's talent for a greater effectiveness and outcome. And I'm a one-to-one -one coach as well. I work as a well-being coach in the workplace and I'm specifically specialized in coaching highly sensitive people. So for a quick, if you don't know what that means, it's a label that in, was researched by Dr. Elaine Aaron in the 90s. And it's actually meaning a neurodivergent individual that have a more um, sensitive nervous system and they absorb and process sens sensory stimuli more um, sensitivity uh, information and others. So I can talk about that for a week. So let's uh, quickly uh, <laughs> uh, close that off. I'm also um, an ex seafarer. I uh, graduated far in 2000 in the Netherlands. I'm dual core trained. I have an engineering degree and I've also my maritime operations degree. I worked as a third, second and first officer on uh, cargo ships. And I've been working in the industry, shipping industry for, for 20 years in different disciplines, vessel coordinator, sales engineer. I've uh, done university. I have an, obtained my uh, human factors degree in maritime accident analysis. And I've been very passionate about that as well. But um, that's enough about me. So let's uh, kick on for the um, presentation. I will try to keep that definitely in 15 minutes. It's, it's hard because I can talk about that all day as well. So we discuss bridging the generational gaps in the maritime workplace. And I will discuss a few facts and figures in this. We have some problem statements. What's actually going on with that? I have a few really nice scenarios for you as well from, from life experience. And finally, how do we break these generational barriers and the way forward? So what's been happening? And for now, the workplace has four generations realistically working all together. Well, there's nothing really new, but for the first time ever across these generations, we have seen an enormous shift and improvement change in how we work. Well, think about the technology compared to the older generation and what we have now. And what about the hybrid working after COVID? It's completely normalized now and opening up to our emotions and feelings. That is definitely a new thing as well to celebrate and, and to do so. But we've also seen massive shifts in our political and social climate that influences our life and our values. But not just that, think about specifically the maritime industry as well, that we cut crews by half compared to the older generations. So there's been, we take all that into consideration in a generational uh, division. And even if we share all the generations, we share the same goals and life visions, the way we look out into the world is specifically shaped by the culture and the climate and our experiences and the things that we see around us and how we grow up. So the maritime communication is, of course, not just generational, but also cultural. And a comment can be misinterpreted so easily by all the filters we just discussed. And it has the cultural aspect to consider as well as huge language barriers. So that is the setting the scene and that is not an easy task. So just a refresher for the generations. I say four generations that work that I don't count the uh, traditionalist or the veterans. They're 78 plus for some still at work, especially with the universities I was working with, still 80 and 90 uh, year old professors. And I hope one day we might be one of them. We have the baby boomers. They're in their 60s. Generation X, that's myself. I'm on the boundary for that. Uh, 40s, late 40s, early 50s. Millennials, they're in their 30s, roughly. And then we have the new generation, late teens, early 20s, Generation Z. So this is this is going to be the new generation. And also the generations that we have quite a lot of communication differences with. So what's the problem? In, in short, like for some, some figures on saying, like in general, almost 90% of the workforce say that a multi-generational workplace makes the world and organization more successful. 
what well, especially true for the seafaring industry is we I chose to see because it's diverse and we love working with different types of people from different generations and different countries. But also nearly 70 percent of these uh, people say that management and managing these diversity is a significant challenge for the company. We have the four generations approximately the number in the UK uh, last measured in 2023. The baby boomers are approximately 12 percent of the workforce at the moment. We have the generation X, that's, that's me, 36 percent, millennials 38 and the younger generations um, starting to overrule the baby boomers at the point of 40%. So these are just rough statistics. I do not have anything from the maritime industry in specific because it's it's quite uh, hard to see if it's UK or you know uh, states. But I do know that in the latest reports, we know that the Generation Z will make up about 27% of the workforce by 2025. So all these boring numbers, yeah. So what, the differences, you have to encounter differences between the work styles and attitudes from the different generations at work. So we know that the, the baby boomers, they like to, they like, in general, this is stereotyping, yeah? They like structure and organization, and they tend to be loyal to the team, adding value and going the extra mile. They're quite hardworking and dedicated. We have the Generation X, they're quite loyal to the managers, they're flexible, want to change the rules, and she change as an opportunity. If you go to directly to the Generation Z, that's we see quite a different change. They're loyal to the experience at work. They think of change as a reality, and they are oh, funny enough that in the latest statistics, they overrule um, flexible workplace they see that as more important than the salary. So that's that's definitely, there are some changes that we can go into and discuss later on. So this is a few um, things about that uh, Generation Z, so the late teens, early 20s, say about the older generations, Xers and Boomers. And this is what I come across in my own coaching practice. So I record that for you. And it's not that I say this, okay? <laughs> They say we're absolutely not allowed to know any more than the boomers because they cannot accept this. We're not allowed to complain about stress or fatigue at work because they had it much worse. There's a few of the things. They take unsafe shortcuts. And if we say something about it, we get shot down. We learn something at school and then they suddenly do differently. Inquisitive students suddenly become know-it-alls. And when they have questions, when we have questions about it, we just all need to stop complaining and stop pointing fingers at people and start cooperating. The bullying at sea culture, that's a whole topic in itself. I put in there, there's lots to talk about there. And the older generations, boomers, see the millennials and Generation Z as their grandchildren instead of colleagues. So that is that's a big point. And um plenty of experiences with that that I won't discuss because we only have like uh, 15 minutes. So let's flip it. And what does the older generations, X and Boomer, say actually about the younger generations? A few of the comments that I came across. Well, the younger generations are snowflakes and they're sick far too often, too sensitive. They cannot handle pressure and command. They demand far too much while we just got on with things, yeah? They don't want to work anymore. They demand shorter leave, less work, flexible work times, <laughs> more salary, complain all the time. And all of a sudden, joking is called bullying. All of a sudden, what's what's happening with that? So you're all still with me, yeah? I've, I just see my screen, so. Yes, we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> so. I have a fantastic scenario for you. This is real life. I um, <clears throat> came across this myself. Sorry. So we have Leah here. Leah is a millennial it's a stock photo, so it's not real. So the millennial or generation I this is in her 30s. She's holding a training session in a company for older managers. 
and it's really happened. And she's developing and delivering a special technology orientated training for managers in the company. And she's um, this is her experience. So even before the training started, she is um, stereotyping is happening before she even started to to present anything. <clears throat> there's ageism, there's gender stereotyping and generational bias. And I know for the, for the fact we are all biased naturally, that comes naturally, we don't do it on purpose. So she needs to work extra hard to prove everybody wrong. This is what she thinks, when she, because she knows this. She knows her age and uh, the experience is maybe lacking. And she knows that she, and by overcompensating, she comes across as a miss know it all and defending herself without even anyone even started to ask a question. This is in fact a, an almost a self-fulfilling prophecy for Leah. And she focused on, by focusing on the facts and statistics and let her work speak for herself who be solution. So this is Glenn and Glenn is a boomer. He's in the older generations and he sits and listens to Leah and he listens to her training program. And he asks a question and he wants to explain more. He wants her to explain more. He asked to back up her knowledge about her experience with the project and he shares he knew a time actually before we even needed all of these new things and it was also very sufficient. It's just a general question to explain but what Leah hears through her own biased filters that she hears oh, this old guy is inflexible stuck in his ways he does not want to go with the times he's bullying me questions my age and assumes I don't know nothing about the topic. That is her inner critic saying, this is not what happened. In truth, both parties did not say this at all. It was her own biased filter that did the work and caused huge misconceptions and is directly responsible for the conflict and the miscommunication. So another scenario for you. Also really, this also really happened and it's again a stock photo, it's not a real manager. And this is Craig. He's a in the older generation, he's a boomer, and he's in his, his 60, 61. He's also a project manager, but just unless like Leah, he is there for 25 years in the company and he listens to Leah talk about his area of expertise, and he feels actually bypassed of his age because she was asked to do the training program and not him. And his inner dialogue is criticizing the HR, crew management, management, uh, company CEOs for choosing the young Leah for the training, while he himself has actually the experience to back it up. That's what his inner dialogue is saying. He feels bypassed and enormous resentment in himself with the emotion. He actually refuses to work together for, with Leah from now on. He wants nothing to do with her or the team or his management. He withdraws into himself and he walks around grumpy. And when anyone asks his opinion, he just answers in sarcastic tone of voice. And, and this, this really happened. So knowing he will likely be made redundant the next round, that's his voice, that's not what happened. His expertise is, will be lost to the world. So here again, Glenn is biased and instead is making assumptions based on his emotions and not facts. So he makes assumptions based on his own biased filters, what he thinks is going on. So let's unpeel this a bit. So what's happening in both scenarios is that there's a stereotyping unconscious bias going on. So for the stereotyping, what we know is the younger generations, what we think they're high on openness, showing emotions freely and believe in equality. They are highly technology uh, generations that communicate through social media, preferably text and online. Um, the older generations are more hierarchical in style of working and structure. They're low in emotion, or at least, you know, they don't show it as much. They're not open. They're hardworking and very committed and prefer communication through face-to-face -face or real life uh, phone or video calls. So that's like a stereotyping here. So when we go explain the unconscious bias, we all look out into the world through our own frame work 
and that framework is made up about your childhood, your uh, social climate, your political climate, your experiences, everything that is all filtered and that forms your frame of mind, which you filter through uh, comments. So the unconscious bias is a, that refers to the attitude, assumptions and beliefs that influence our thinking without conscious awareness. Is, this is not like it occurs in a split second and it's um, it's everybody does it. And the most famous one is, of course, the gender bias and racial bias, but also generational division comes through it. And we all judge a book by its cover. Right. We all think I'm, I, I had a boss when he was 30 years of age. So that's at least 10 years younger than me. And uh, I thought, you know. What does he know? <laughs> and I think, oh, that's an unconscious bias, totally not acceptable. But we also deal with the mental filtering. So the mental filtering is a sort of a negative um, type of pattern where we filter out things we want to hear, where we bias towards, what we believe we see. So for a little, are you up for a little experiment for that? So I want you to look around you in your office space and I want you to look for anything that is blue. Yeah. If you look around you, I can't see you doing it, but I'm watching <laughs> anything that's blue. Yeah. You you pick something. You close your eyes now for a second. Yeah. And then tell me if you saw anything that was red. If you saw anything that is red in your mind, you might have thought, oh, hey, that was not expecting that. I didn't see anything. You most likely didn't see anything that was red. So that is the mental filtering. If you're having a bad grumpy day, you go out into the station and all of a sudden everybody is reacting grumpy as well. That's mental filtering. So to link that with the uh, conflicts at work and things, we react versus respond. So what is actually the difference between a reaction and a response? So reacting comes from emotion. It's passive aggressive, it's short sighted. Uh, we overreact and we jump to conclusions based on what we believe and what we see. And that leads to more issues. Yeah, if you tell me um, I'm, a, I'm a real terrible person, uh, because uh, I don't know, I come from the Netherlands and nobody likes me. Like I jump into straight in, I go like, well, who do you think I am? How, how dare you judge me? That is reacting. Responding is what we all like to do. We all want to be calm. We are respond through vision, goals, values. We respond from knowledge and we focus on the facts in the ideal world and we think before we speak. That's what we love to do. Then that leads to more solutions. So how do we do that? Because that's not easy because we do have emotions. So that means that comes with training, with self-aware, the aware of your filters. What are your filters? What are your biases? Breathe after a comment, after a nasty comment or something that you don't agree with. You breathe and create some space between the conflict argument or the comment first. You place it into context. The context of the argument is really important because do we misinterpret it? Is it a cultural thing? Is it a language barrier? There are things generational. There are different things that's happening and are at play. So what are these circumstances? Can we reverse it, place ourselves in their shoes? What, what are, what's their point of view? And does that change your response? Can you rephrase um, instead? Paraphrasing is a very good one that we do in coaching quite a lot to repeat what they said. So you think I'm no good because I'm from the Netherlands. <laughs> it's a bad example, by the way. And they heard you talking back and they might rephrase it for you. It's like, oh, yeah, but I didn't really mean it like that. And you acknowledge their point of view calmly and you explain your comment and context and create an open conversation. Like you want to explain, can you can you explain more about that? Or thank you for that, you know, there to keep the emotions out of out of your conversation. So I know there's lots more to the story, and it's just a quick presentation to be aware. So the three main solutions that you can implement already is like to improve your communication across this generational division. It's like be aware that there is a generational differences. 
but avoid a generational bias. You know, not all Generation Zers are lazy or drinking coffee or lattes all day, and not all the boomers are quite strict and are archaeal and don't know technology. And so get to know your individual employees, like get to know them a little bit better and encourage their feedback. Know like the whole team for feedback, invite them and in their opinion, let them know they're all equally valued. You know, where differences, we create strength. Everybody has their own unique traits. And creating opportunities for gross generational coaching. So the problems with your team, uh, create the opportunities for members for different ages and work together with a coach or mentor or training program and bridge the generational differences. So by doing so, you can build better rapport and trust with each other and trade, you know, swap knowledge and skills. So that was me. Thank you. You can look me up on um, my website's going to be renewed, tinakazoot.com. If you, uh, I do one to one coaching, team workshops, and conflict management as well. You can um, freely have a conversation with me and let me know how I can personally can help you and your team or your employees happier and better, conflict free. Thank you. So let me immediately ask a question, Tineke. And you know we've been talking about it because you were trying to help me but let's bring everybody in we were trying to approach some of our members who were complaining to me or in passing they were expressing their concerns about the communication gap they have in in the office and believe yeah. it or not as a secretary general i get some questions from our members and um, there was a question about the lifting and this and that but the biggest issue we have is um one several companies actually not just one in scotland approached us and said we've got this issue we would like to do something about that and when we suggested mm -hmm. then they actually organize a meeting or organize a training course people who were to organize this chicken out they were not able to actually name the problem because as soon as they said we would like to invite those who are highly sensitive people together with boomers or whoever, both groups got very upset. Both groups were saying, so are you calling me a highly sensitive person? And the others, are you calling me to be a set in my own ways? And so on and so forth. Mm. Tineke, how to deal with it? How to actually bring two teams to actually talk? Or maybe not two, because why should we stereotype? Why don't we want team to talk to each other? How to organize it? What would be your advice to the HR people? who, in my opinion, should be really looking into it and helping the operational chaps like technical superintendents, marine superintendents to actually absorb all of this knowledge. Over to you. Long, long time ago, when I was just in workforce new, I remember having a real problem from I just came from the sea. I worked at shore and my first source I job and I didn't get on with the older type of people they didn't take me seriously all this stereotyping going on in my own head as well and I remember HR lady came to me and say we have a course for you so um for you to better learn to understand and work better with these people I was I was I went bananas <laughs> I was so upset it's like I, I was ranting on to my boyfriend at a time saying how dare they suggest that something's wrong with me they should have the course not me and then looking back so many years later looking back i think no that's not what she meant she meant like if i be more resilient with it and learn to communicate in a different way change perspective and see things from both angles i will be better with it so it's maybe it's it's the way um a way of bringing it not as a problem but as a solution orientated workshop like how can we um harness the whole team's talent and how would you bring like the highly sensitive is mean is not a negative label at all it's somebody who is more receptive towards um the subtleties in a room and that can be really really productive so how can we like have a workshop and 
to bring the best out of everybody equally. It's like a form of diversity and inclusion, but without, you know, the um, cultural aspects, but with like talent, like bring all the neurodiverse people in there as well and learn to deal and uh, work with it. So it's it's probably a, a word a phrasing instead of people jump into the reaction immediately from emotion like there's you think there's something wrong with me so and that is with the with the older generation and the younger ones at the same time like oh yeah there's nothing wrong with me I'm not stuck in my ways they're 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 stuck in their ways so that yeah focus on solutions thank you Tineke thank you very much for that sorry I had somebody asking me for something um another question and obviously I'm opening the floor so if you've got anything please put your electronic hand up I'll see it as yellow in front of me and I'll be watching for yellow now, okay? So don't ask about red or blue, yellow only. Um, Tineke, um, have you had any requests from the shipping companies actually to address that during the officers' seminars? You know, we do organize yearly or even sometimes twice a year seminars for our officers. Has this been brought to your attention? Have you been involved in anything like that? Giving some assistance to the seafarers now who are actually facing the same problems, same issues as everybody in office. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I've been a few weeks ago, there was a human factors symposium in Glasgow. And uh, that was really interesting that we linking the, um, the younger generation Z type of work and the gap of seafarers experienced seafarer captains in in a few years there's a there's going to be a huge gap in in a shortage of experienced people because they quit you have enough people coming in and they quit halfway and i get like um clients as well younger really younger just students or just been at sea for a few months they quit already think that it's a bullying culture it's toxic it's not enough technology there's a whole lot of set of problems in there um so there's definitely there's there's a link between the generational divisions, the gap in the, um, the shortage of seafarers at the same time, and the bullying and harassment culture and the mental health culture that is all like up in the open at the moment is really talked about. It's all linked. That really good. Okay, thank you, um, Lisa. Please. Yeah, good day, everybody, and, and thank you so much for a really interesting and Im important presentation. So I learned a lot and was taking notes. One thing you you said really resonated with me. You you talked about different ways of communication that the, the older older bands tend to use the phone, and Gen X and and Gen Z are all about email and other social media. So I, I work at a company and I I manage a team that's mostly younger those younger generations. And they're very, very much communicating by email. And our, our, I'm in a testing business and we organize testing on ships. So there's a lot of communication that's needed across our company and, and with the clients. And there's really seems to be a tendency not to pick up the phone. And I feel like it, occasionally we really need to do that to build relationships both within the company and out especially within the company i guess there's more more resistance to do that just because everybody's so busy it seems perfectly natural and reasonable for me to suggest that everybody kind of starts having a goal of you know call up a colleague in a different country once a month just so you have that more real interaction um but maybe that's my bias. Is is that unreasonable to expect that or to put that goal out there for people? Definitely, uh, Lisa. I I hear you. I I have the same issues um, personally. I always like we worked at V Group and Cuba. You've probably been there. We worked at two floors and the fifth floor. We were at the third floor. It was my personal goal when I just started to instead of emailing these people, I thought it they're just on the fifth floor I can walk up there <laughs> by the stairs and talk yeah. to them in person that was so weird for a lot of people like what do you do you could just more efficient to do an email I said yeah but I want to have that personal bond and I'm meeting with real people and make yeah. sure they know me so that they can contact me and things 
And there is, is that like, it's as well as a cultural thing, probably, or work culture thing, as well as in personal preference and in the era you grow up in. Like, um, there's a lot of new generations that are far more, they like, they texting me on messenger <laughs> for me that is personal I nobody yeah. really does that to me yeah. like but they do and you see mm -hmm. also the you know several several handymen is like trying to establish a sort of um a common ground like what is realistic to expect if they get like a lot of anxiety from from um calling somebody then it's it's you're missing the complete goal of your of the collaborating to each other right yeah I'm, yeah and and nobody has said that you know it gives me anxiety I don't know if that's unsaid and and I'm not a super social person myself but I just feel like every once in a while if if we have that even by video you you get to know people yeah. and understand them and then things that can be misunderstood on email because it's so easy to misunderstand the tone and the the meaning especially yes. when people are are working quickly so so i guess the question that i have to ask and and figure out is is this anxiety inducing and if it's if the barrier is just i'm busy and i don't want to add another thing to my day that's different from this is really uncomfortable for me and if they're busy, I need to figure out to, how to take something off their plate so they can make one phone call a month, you know, to build. Yeah, to, it's to, like, to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Opening up, opening up the floor to discussion, like, is there a reason why you don't want to use a phone call? If they say, hey, like, we can do five more meetings uh, online on uh, on an email, on a messenger than you do in a whole day on a phone call, that's a different way of working and open up the floor for discussion see like let them know your uh vision like maybe introduce them for a, a, a meeting really really everybody in the room or even if that's the goal can you manage once a month can you manage that like everybody meeting once a month because lost in translation on a on a on a text on an email the tone of voice mm -hmm. i was having somebody who was typing to me in cap, cap captions like caps lock accidentally I think, why is this person shouting to me? How dare they? <laughs> right. It's, there are some things that you cannot, um, I think you have to be quite strict with. There's some things cannot be compromised, I think. But I'm old school. I'm hard. I'm biased as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just feel like if I want, if we want to build connective tissue, just doing it by not seeing anybody's face, not never hearing their voice, only working by email it seems like we're missing an opportunity there yeah yeah i think so too okay. personally okay. i think so too but we have to let them speak as well from what do you think what is it your um what's your vision on that because there at some point there are the newer they take over and then we have to deal with it and uh, yeah that's yeah. not easy okay that's really helpful thank you thank thank you and um uh... Tina, I cannot see any more hands. I would like to thank you very much. That was really good. I appreciate that. And um, I've forgotten one subject I was supposed to bring as well. Uh, there is a very heated discussion among our members about EU ETS. And maybe you saw my message yesterday. We did the poll, which I thank you very much, all members, for responding and uh, answering three questions. What is your attitude towards the EU ETS? The message went out yesterday. If you haven't received it, by all means, get in touch with me. I'll resend it to you. But as predicted, I suppose, majority of our members are very happy to help the owners, but don't like to take the full responsibility. I think from the top of my head, it was 50% responses. Don was 10% who said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do anything. And uh, the rest, 30% were saying, uh, and mostly those who are owners themselves, or the big ship managers are saying we are very happy to do that for the owners and be fully responsible for it, but obviously we will charge for it. Uh, if there are any comments, any other subjects, any homework for me, then I'm more than happy to open the floor now. So I'm listening, please. Nothing then. OK, it's 11.39. Thank you very much, everybody. It will be recorded, so I'm stopping recording now and saying goodbye to you, and I'll see you next week. 
in London. And if not, I'll see you in two weeks' time when we will be talking about EU ETS. All from me today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Tanika. Very Bye, nice uh, presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ajay. Okay. Thank you.